So my name is Olivia and I have been struggling for years with really severe uh, treatment resistant major depression. Okay, my name is Kim Eba. I was diagnosed with crystal storing, histiocytosis, one of 80 people in the world to be documented with that. I'm Conrad Reynoldson. I uh, am 38 years old with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I'm Victoria, and I am currently in a multiple sclerosis tri trial, excuse me, at Johns Hopkins. I currently live here. So years ago, I was a genetic disease that mainly affects the respiratory and the in the United States, the practice of a healthcare profession is based on where a patient is located at the time the care is delivered. If I'm a physician and I'm seeing a patient via telemedicine, I have to be licensed where that patient is located during the visit. Now, pre-COVID, we actually did interact with patients across state lines. For telemedicine visits, there was this restriction, but for ages, we've been talking to the patients over the phone, we've been my chart messaging with patients, and we did not ask where they were. But because of regulations around telemedicine visits, we needed to ask where they were before they, we provided care. During COVID, most states said, it's okay, you can see patients into our state and we won't do anything to you providers. So although we had a telemedicine office pre-COVID, we only had about 80 telemedicine visits per month 800 total, all of a sudden 70% of our outpatient visits by May of 2020 are telemedicine. That's 100,000 visits across Johns Hopkins Medicine in that kind of second month. It stayed at about 30,000 per month. So we've now crossed 2 million telemedicine visits. It's used across a ton of different specialties from primary care to psychiatry, neurology, neurosurgery, genetics. It's part of the fabric of how we deliver outpatient. And then all of those waivers started to expire as state public health emergencies expired. Eight years ago, I was diagnosed with a very rare disease. And my doctors here in Asheville, North Carolina are very good. There's a cancer center, but they told me up front that I would need someone who specialized in my disease because they had read about it, but had never treated it. Specifically with this community, you know, we really rely on specialists and they can be across the country anywhere. To me, there's a difference between routine care, you know, um, and these unique situations. So I was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis when I was three months old. Um, I grew up seeing my doctors like my entire life. So the fall of 2020, I went off to college and got super sick, developed pneumonia and went into liver failure. I was at the local hospital who wasn't set up to treat me because of the complexity of my condition. There are urgent situations across our country and we hear from our patients frequently where patients are really needing to receive cross-state care today and they can't because of state-based li state licensure rules, including cancer care, transplant care, rare diseases, college student mental health, and you know clinical trials from an innovation standpoint. And so we really want patients to be able to connect with their providers and with their families, regardless of geography, so they can get the care they need. Here we were, my, my father just having had his first uh, stroke, he couldn't, he couldn't function. Eve is in San Francisco, Francois, in Baltimore, Philippe in Florida. So the only way that they could have been involved and their involvement was critical was by Zoom. Given that it's a neurologic, specifically a neurologic illness, Mark had a lot of questions at that time, and we really had to reiterate the information. Each of us, you know, kind of heard things in different ways and could interpret things a little bit differently and stress things differently. Um, and so I think without all of us sort of being each other's backups, you know, on, on Team Mark, I think it was it would be really difficult. Not have to actually fly across the country um, and uh, and be present in a meeting, which is impossible, right? I mean, the fact is, it means that one of us is sharing the information with the rest of us. Uh, and to, be, to all be able to be present in a meeting uh, makes the most enormous difference. In ways that could have been life-saving. The impact on patients I would break into two categories. One is stress and psychosocial and the other is logistical and um, a logistical burden. So from the stress and psychosocial burden, 
you have a rare condition or a life-threatening condition and you live in the United States of America and you want to have the access to the specialist who you feel is the best to treat your condition. You know, there's a lot of hospitals out here, but when I went to Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, MD Anderson, Sloan Kettering, who diagnosed me for the third opinion, UPMC, who did the second opinion, yet when they were done, they had no clue what to do with me. They knew what I had. It's just hard. And to find somebody that knows what to do with me, you just you just can't imagine until you're in my shoes. You just don't know. I can't be the only one that it's financially a burden or hard at 65 to drive seven hours, but to feel that you only trust this doctor. What has struck me as a lawyer is that it's federally codified that you have a right to try. The way it stands right now for telemedicine, they've made it impossible to do that. You only have the right to try if you actually have the financial resources, the will, and the ability to travel around the country, right? So when your child is in, um, is considered to be terminal, who has something like osteosarcoma, you don't have the luxury of that kind of time. It also affects continuity of care, for example, when somebody moves around and being able to keep those same specialists. Uh, and then another big thing is provider shortages, especially in um, key areas like mental health, where um, people in this community and the broader disability community have really been affected, and especially those who uh, are in rural parts of the country or simply have trouble being able to get to physical appointments in person. I'm rolling the dice. I have a van that has a crane because I'm in a wheelchair. So I can't just like run a car. My problem seeing the road, I had to pull off. My train of thought breaks because I did do the 48 rounds of chemo. And again, being by myself, what am I going to do? I don't have anybody to rely on. So telehealth is better. And one of the realities is that because of seven years of chemo and because my immune system is now damaged um, to the point that I'm having to get treatment for it, any time I get on the road, I am taking a risk. Someone who's already sick, they're, you know, they're tired, they're needing to sleep more, they're in pain, they're experiencing symptoms. And to have, you know, a um, immunocompromised cancer patient need to get on a plane uh, to go see a provider just seems like a totally unnecessary burden. I don't understand why it is that we we have these very strict um, sort of rules in place about uh, treating people across state lines in situations where treatment across state lines is essential. It is so important. A healthy person doesn't understand you need to walk in my shoes to understand what telehealth can do for me. It's ridiculous to even think that there's risks on telemedicine, in my opinion. I'm, I'm just a good old boy that doesn't understand some of the politics and things like that. But to be able to sit here, we're in Florida, you're in Maryland, or DC, wherever you all are, and we're talking. Why would you put a restriction on that when it comes to someone's life? We know it can be done and it has been done. And instead, I think we've lacked the creativity and the will to address something that should be addressed. And it has real life impacts on countless people, uh, both in my community as well as more broadly. And so this is something that can be done, and it's something that we have to do. I, I mean, I don't know why it isn't acceptable that it, that they this is not the norm of care. This should be the norm of care. You know, with 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 telemedicine, a lot of what 
Maggie needed wasn't a physical exam. It was a conversation. It was what tests should I be getting next? You know, what did my labs look like? Her labs could be done anywhere in the country. She just needed the doctor who knew her well to look at them and say, this looks okay, this doesn't look okay. This is not gonna make the final cut, but it just drives me nuts. And that is that, um, you know, that I, I can, I can, maybe I'm not allowed to, but we do it all the time. I can enter uh, any application and send an email to my doctor saying, this is happening, you know, what do you suggest? Or can we adjust this or whatever? Did, have you had a chance to look at the results when I was last there? And the doctor will respond to me. But I can't do that by video. I can do it by email. I can do it by, but I can't do it by, by video. I, I don't get it. Turn. You have to, if you're somebody who has a condition and you, and you find that team that works and they're in your best interest and you feel like they've got your back, you don't want to lose that team. That team is so important to you. The foundation really is patient care. The foundation is not money. The foundation is not corporate pockets. The foundation really is patient care. What's best for the patient is to have access. Access to health care, access to quality care, access to things that are working. And telemedicine in this day and age is a big part of it. You know, few good things came out of COVID, and this was, you know, one of them. And I think it's like, you know, let's learn from what actually worked and helped in COVID and was easier for patients and families. Ten years from now, I want to look back at this time and think we did not let that crisis go to waste. We harnessed the learnings that we had from COVID and we figured out a way to move forward and solve this issue to really positively impact the lives of patients. If not us, who?